Okay, g'day all and welcome to another video. So the topic of today is Agnafog's VCL or the Vector Class Library. I posted a, an introduction video to this library already and I'll leave a link for that up above. So have a bit of a watch of that if you're not sure what the Vector Class Library is. Basically, the Vector Class Library is a SIMD library which uh, allows us to do SIMD or single instruction multiple data without using uh, intrinsics and without using assembly. So the objective today is to look at a few more advanced examples of using the vector class library or VCL and to explore just how much speed uh, you can actually get from, uh, from using this library over regular C++. Okay, so today we're going to have three graphical examples. So I want to keep these things graphical just so that we've got something interesting to look at. The first example is emulating HDR or high dynamic range. The second example is going to be fractals. And the third example, which I've called Render Lab, a bit of a teaser for an upcoming project, uh, that's actually a non-destructive 64 bits per channel image editor. Uh, all of these examples are graphical, so it might help to have a, a, a very small uh, detour into uh, graphics programming or, or just a little graphics primer. Every pixel on your computer monitor is represented by a tiny red, green and blue light. And the little lights can vary in intensity from 0% all the way up to 100%. 100% red, 0% green and 0% blue. And when you show that as a pixel on the monitor, it's going to look bright red. Uh, whereas you could do 0% red, 100% green, and 0% blue. Uh, when you show that as a pixel, it's going to look bright green. And then what you end up doing is mixing these colors together. So we could do something like 100% um, red and 100% green. So that actually gives you a bright yellow color. Um, you know, you can mix the colors to however you want. You could say 50% red, 25% green, and 75% blue, etc., etc. But you end up with all of the uh, different colored pixels that we, that we know and love on our monitor. So the pixels are actually just represented as an array and the zeroth element or the first element of the array is actually the top left of the screen. And then as you increase the elements in the array, it actually goes across to the right until you go from uh, the very top left of your screen all the way down to the bottom right. So the pixels themselves are just three little arrays. One array is for the red and the next array is of the green component of each pixel and the third array is the blue component of each pixel. Uh, there is other ways to do this, of course, different ways of laying out pixels, but for the examples that we're going to look at, that's how they're laid out. Okay, on to demo number one. So, before we go any further, we have to say what is HDR or high dynamic range. So, most monitors uh, that you buy with your laptops or your PCs, even most, uh, most televisions, are uh, what's, uh, what's sort of called normal dynamic range, or they're not HDR. For each channel, say the red channel of each pixel, uh, it's got a certain range of brightnesses. So it might range from zero all the way up to 255. Uh, that's fairly standard. That means that each channel is actually a byte. So likewise, the green channel would also range from zero to 255, and the blue channel from zero to 255. Uh, what an HDR television does, or an HDR monitor, it uses more bits per channel. So a common number for HDR TVs is actually 10 bits. So if the red channel has 10 bits of data per pixel, then instead of ranging from 0 to 255, it can range from 0 all the way up to 1023. So this means that the number of different colors that we can specify on the screen is greatly increased. Instead of having 256 reds, 256 greens, and 256 blues per pixel, an HDR TV can actually specify 1,024 different colors cubed. Now, so as you can imagine, that's a huge amount more information or a huge amount more dynamic range. I should also mention at some point that we are emulating HDR here, and a true HDR TV will actually have a blacker black, maybe, and a brighter white. So the, the dynamic range of luminance is often greater for an HDR TV as well. Um, we're not emulating that with our monitors. This little program is just emulating the bit depth. Yeah. Okay, so what you'll see when you look at the screen, you'll see it just looks like a, a green gradient, sort of green on one side and bluey on the other. As I scroll through a little bit, uh, you'll see that it changes colors. It's actually changing colors with sine waves. Uh, there's quite obvious bars across the screen. The gradient is not smooth. Uh, I've exaggerated this for the video because the video itself will be encoded in 8 bits per channel. 
So you watching at home, you wouldn't be able to see this effect over, uh, over YouTube. The gradient is not smooth at all, but if I hit F2, uh, what you should see is that the gradient becomes perfectly smooth. So it changes from obvious bars to a perfectly smooth gradient. So what's happening here is that the number of pixels across the screen is actually greater than 256. So as the blue pixels gradually change into green, now you don't have the option of doing that smoothly. There's only 256 different gradations of blue, so you can actually see the points where those colors change. Yeah, but that's the um, 8 bits per channel there. And that is the HDR emulation, perfectly smooth. And if you have a look at the little readout here at the top, um, just ignore the top value, that render time there. That's the actual time to render the sine wave. Uh, we're not interested in that for now. What we'll look at is 1.6, just about, to render the regular 8-bit version on this monitor. It's taking C++ about 1.5 milliseconds. So it's very quick. Uh, but as we change to 16-bit uh, true, just down here, what you'll see is that render time there jumped up to about 24 milliseconds. Uh, as we turn on VCL, you'll see that that render time there jumps down to about 2.3 or 4 milliseconds. Um, okay, so this is a regular C++ code, and I hope to just show this uh, first as a little example to uh, illustrate clearly what the algorithm is actually doing. So for every 16-bit pixel, we actually break it into two bytes. The top half is the main color, and the low half is actually the chances that will increment that main color. So once we've got the top half, or the top 8 bits, we save that in our little unsigned int here as uh, capital RGB as the main color. Uh, then what we do is we choose a random number, generate a random number from 0 to 255. Uh, if that random number is greater than the low byte, then we increment the main color. And that's pretty much all there is to it. It gives us uh, random dithering. So the pixels are actually flickering very slightly. Uh, anyway, then we just awe our colors together and we display them. So we won't actually go into how the monitor truly displays things uh, very much, but it actually displays packed pixels, RGB, 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 like that with um, yeah, bytes for each channel. Anyway, the, the, the last little bit here is just packing our pixels together so that they can actually be displayed on the monitor. Yeah, but the crux of it is this, really. We just split our little uh, byte into two split our little short integer into two parts. The top half is the main color and the bottom half we use to generate a random number and dither. Uh, so what we do in the vectorized version, I actually load uh, 32 pixels at once. So this is really where SIMD in the VCL gets its speed from. Um, you're not doing one pixel at a time, you're doing 32 at once per iteration of the loop. So the tricky bit, and really the fun bit of it all, is figuring out how you can achieve your algorithms um, using both highly parallel vectors, but at the same time performing the same operations on your elements. So let's have a bit of a look at how it works. So the first thing that we do is we, we read um, 32 elements into two, two little vectors here, red one and red two. So we'll just look at the red channel. There's uh, also the green channels and the blue channels down here, but they're exactly the same. Uh, the next thing that we do is R chance equals compress R1 and R2. Now that's actually going to grab the low bytes of the red channels and compress them into a single vector of 32 bytes. Uh, then we grab the top and we store that as our main channel or our capital R just here. Uh, then we've got something similar to before. This is a random number generator, X or shift random number generator. Only in this instance we've got um, parallel SIMD random number generation. So we check if our randomly generated values are less than R chance or the low byte from each channel. And that is actually going to become a Boolean uh, vector. So Boolean vectors will actually have 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 across all of the elements where the comparison was true. And they'll have 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 across all of the elements that were false. So for this one just here, these are actually bytes. Uh, we're going to end up with uh, eight ones across any of the byte elements where the uh, randomly selected number was less than chance. And we're going to end up with zeros where the randomly selected number was greater than or equal to chance. So then what we've got to do is uh, convert that to a one. Uh, so I've just used and just here to and those results with one. But what we end up with is um, ones every time we want to increment, every time the randomly selected pixel should increment, and zeros where it should not. 
Okay, so the next step is to actually add those ones to the main color. So we don't want this to wrap around. If one of the main colors is actually 255 or it's maxed out, say the red channel, then you might run the risk of wrapping round. Uh, after 255 comes zero. Uh, a byte just overflows and wraps back round to zero. Now we don't want that to happen. So what we do at the end here, another really interesting uh, ability of the VCL is add saturated. Uh, saturating arithmetic will actually prevent the numbers from wrapping round. So it's gonna add one to all of the pixels that we actually chose to add one to. Uh, but if that adding of one would result in the 255 overflowing to zero, then saturating arithmetic will stop that and we'll just set it to a maximum of 255. And the rest of the instructions down here are just combining the data together so that the monitor can actually display it. Yeah, we don't really have to worry about that. We just use uh, extend is the opposite of compress. So uh, uh, one of the other things that I want to briefly show is that XOR RAND VCL RGB. So this is actually going to choose our random bytes. So I've actually set up three different states here, VCLR, VCLG, and VCLB. And I've used uh, three different uh, XOR shift random number generators. Now, so each of these random number generators, the VCLR, for example, it's actually choosing eight different 32-bit uh, random numbers. And then we're, we're just reading those um, elements as, as though they were bytes. Yeah, so we're effectively getting um, 32 random bytes per three instructions. Yeah, it's really, really good throughput for random number generation. Okay, so moving on to the second example. So the second example or demo number two is fractals. Okay, so the fractals that we're just about to look at are actually variations on the Julia set, which is a very common fractal. Uh, the first example is actually the Julia set. Uh, just a, a quick primer on the way that the Julia set is actually, uh, is actually computed. We get each pixel across the screen has an X and a Y position. So that's its uh, horizontal position and its vertical position. Uh, we just pretend that for each pixel that's an imaginary number or a complex number with the real part being the x component and the imaginary part being the y component and then all we do we square that imaginary number and we add some constant and then we get the result and we square it and we add some constant then we get the result see so we just Iterate. We just keep putting in the results to the uh, same little squaring and adding the constant. So what happens is uh, after a while, if we keep iterating this, then the magnitude of the result is actually going to shoot off to infinity. So the result is actually going to get larger and larger if we keep iterating this little function. Uh, or the result is going to get smaller and it's actually just going to sort of home in on some value. It's going to stay settled and not shoot off to infinity. If our value shoots off to infinity or if it breaks out of this predefined bound, then we color the pixel on the screen uh, based on how long it took for the pixel to escape. Uh, anyway, that's just a little primer on how these things are actually drawn on the screen. And, but for now, let's have a bit of a look at the fractals themselves. Uh, okay, so here, here is the uh, Julia set itself. This uh, version of the VCL code is actually multi-threaded. So you end up getting a, a lot of speed from VCL. You also get a lot of speed from multi-threading, <laughs> funnily enough. Yeah, but I actually chose these colors here randomly too. I thought they were maybe a little bit like fire or something like that. Yeah, but you just cycle through the uh, Julia sets. Interesting stuff. Amazing uh, images. I mean, if you've, if you've never seen fractals before, I thoroughly recommend having a, a good look through this. It's absolutely astonishing pictures. Uh, the zoom level that this program actually lets you zoom in is not great. Yeah, it's not huge, but the, the detail of these things is infinite. Yeah, these, these images go on forever. So we just hit R to reset. So that's the Julia set itself. Okay, number two. Number two I called skewed. So it's similar to the Julia set, only it looks a little bit skewed. Quite a bit like fire in a way. Yeah, it looks a bit like fire. All right, number three. So number three I called water. I thought this was very like um, a fluid or water of some sort. Yeah, just kind of flowing. Maybe oil on water, something like that. Yeah, it's amazing really. The, the kinds of organic patterns that you can generate just with this strange little game of squaring a complex number and adding a uh, constant. Number four, I've called this one robots. Let's just fast forward a little bit. And we'll get this, uh, there you go, look at that. It's like a small robot of some sort. Okay, so I don't know if that actually looks like a robot, sort of organic in a way, but also robotic, I thought. Yeah, so I called it robots. Interesting fractal. So a lot of this region here that is uh, painted a flat color, 
uh, there may or may not be colored pixels in there. Now you just don't know. So some of the pixels may never escape, but others wouldn't actually be colored that flat color. It's just that the um, iterations of the, see I like that too, it sort of becomes a large version of the robot. Um, the iterations weren't set high enough and things like that. So very, very highly zoomed in and detailed fractals are actually really compute intensive. They're difficult for the uh, computer to actually generate. Okay, this one I called the kaleidoscope and I just used crazy colors for this. So there's a lot of uh, transcendental functions going on here, a lot of power. I mean, there's a lot of uh, compute intensive stuff going on here to generate these, uh, these images. Now, I really wanted to push the uh, VCL and the CPU and just see what it was capable of. That's a crazy bit just there. Wow. Okay, so this is the final fractal that I want to show out of the six. This one I've called the vampire for reasons which will soon become extremely obvious. So again, we're just playing around with the complex function just here. It's so strange what can come out of it. Okay, so as we scroll through a little bit, we see something that kind of resembles a vampire. You sort of see his ears just here and his wings a little bit. But have a look at this. As we scroll through a bit further, wow. <laughs> Looks like a little vampire bat taking a big bite out of something. Amazing. Yeah, I like that. He's a sweet little dude. He's a sweet little vampire. There you go. We have a little bit of a table just here. So I wanted to show the speeds that we got from both uh, VCL itself and also then uh, multi-threading. The ratios B1 and B2, these are the ratios of VCL over C++ and B2 is the ratio of multi-threaded VCL over VCL. So the total gains here on the Julia set that we got from using VCL and from using 8-way multi-threading, it's 23.6 times faster. The skewed fractal uh, actually came out to be about 30 uh, times faster. So we got a really good gain there. Um, what you'll see, some of these times the VCL itself actually adds most of the speed. So for the skewed fractal, the VCL actually times the performance by 8. Um, and the multi-threading only times it by 3.6. Uh, okay, so for the water fractal, we actually ended up with 20 times speed improvement. And uh, the robots fractal, we ended up with a little bit less. It's about 8.25 speed improvement. The kaleidoscope, we actually recorded uh, about 22 and a half times faster than regular C++. And the vampire on the end there, so the speed gain there from the VCL is about 4.2. And the speed gain from multi-threading was about 5. So collectively about 21.11 uh, times faster. Okay, so let's have a bit of a look at the code as to how to actually render these things. So this is the C++ code just here. Uh, we define a complex number using the uh, C time. The C time is actually set in the program by using the P and L keys. Okay, then we define the actual escape barrier and then for each of the pixels on the screen, or in other words, for Y equals zero all the way up to the height of the screen and for X equals zero all the way to the width, uh, we grab ourselves a pixel so we have a, a little computation just here just to try and set the pan and zoom so that we can actually see the fractal. Then we've got our complex number, so comp val just here. Here's the, the iteration loop itself. So comp val equals mul comp val comp val. So that just is uh, square the complex value. And then add cr, the, uh, the little constant just there. Uh, then we just check the escape magnitude, check if our pixel has escaped. And if it has, then we color it by, uh, by that value. Yeah, so that's just about it. So the uh, lookup table is uh, is called current gradient. Yeah, so the lookup table actually changes depending on the exact fractal that we've selected. And the headers here, vampire gradient.h and kaleidoscope.h, water gradient.h, uh, they all specify the gradients themselves. Okay, so if we have a bit of a look at the VCL code or the multi-threaded code, uh, we'll see that it's similar in some respects. So comp8f is just a little complex number class that I've written. There is actually a complex number add-on that you can get uh, for the VCL, but I've rolled my own just here, just because of the layout of the pixels. Uh, anyway, CR is the constant that we're adding. Once again, we just set that up as uh, sine waves. And vec8f0, so just some constants that we use in the iterations. So this XX just here is actually my uh, eight different X counters in my uh, X for loop. 
Yeah, SIMD counters. So instead of setting up just a scalar, counting from zero to, to 16 or something, so in SIMD you actually set up a bunch of different simultaneous counters. So here we've got um, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven will be the elements that we actually begin our X counters at. And then at the bottom of your for loop, what you wanna do if you're using these SIMD4 counters like this, instead of adding one, uh, what you actually do is add the count of elements. So in our particular instance, we're doing eight way SIMD. So for our X counters, what we want to do is add eight. Yeah, you just get uh, like eight little for loops counting up in SIMD style. Okay, so once again, we set up our comp val uh, just here with, with much the same computation as before. So that just sets up the pan and the zoom. Um, okay, so the actual iterations themselves. So we perform the square of comp val, so mul comp val comp val, and then add comp val cr or add on the constant. So once again, pretty much exactly the same as before. Uh, if we scroll down a little bit, now the tricky part is that we've got to figure out who out of the eight elements has actually escaped. So we've got to do some little uh, branchless programming trickery here because if you remember, we can't say if a particular element does something, then, um, you know, branch uh, mid vector. You can't do that. Uh, in SIMD, you've got to do the same operation to every element. Uh, so you can see here that escaped magnitude check 8f is very, very simple. It's just a comparison. Yeah, just checking if uh, each element is greater than or equal to the magnitude root or, or the square root of the magnitude. This is actually Euclidean distance here, incidentally. Any elements that have escaped or are greater than or equal to the escape uh, limit will become ones and any elements that have not escaped will become zeros. Okay, so of those that have escaped, we have to figure out what round they escaped. So current round just here is uh, another vector, but it's the same value for every element. So in the first round or the zeroth round, it's gonna be zero, 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 or eight zeros. And then that's just incremented each round. Uh, if we end that with the Boolean vector from before, then what we're gonna get is either zero, across any vectors that haven't actually escaped, uh, or we're going to get the current round. And then what we've got to do, we've got to figure out of those people or of those pixels that have escaped, uh, which ones escaped this round. If a pixel escapes at round one, then we have to make sure that we don't then overwrite that value with, uh, with say, a three at round three. It's a difficult thing to explain uh, in English, but it's, it's, it's fairly simple in, uh, in Boolean algebra. You just do XOR. <laughs> and then we just uh, all those together to say escaped so far. That's the total uh, elements that have escaped uh, all up. Uh, we do current round plus plus so that the current round is, uh, is incremented one. And down here we have what's called a horizontal and. So another of the uh, interesting operations or functions available in the VCL. So a horizontal and unlike a vertical and will actually and the elements within a vector. So we've got to figure out if everybody has escaped. So if all of the pixels of the eight, if all of them have escaped, then this horizontal and just here will return true. And if there's one or more pixels that is yet to escape, then the horizontal and or the anding together of all eight elements will actually return false. Yeah, so we do actually have to add a little branch there at the end. We can't make the entire thing uh, branchless. So I do want to just point out the plot vec 8f function, if we just have a bit of a look at that. So there's another interesting function in uh, VCL, which is lookup, which actually allows LUTs or lookup tables. Yeah, so this is what's called a scattered load. So what we're actually doing here is for each of the pixels within the eight, we're potentially loading a different color from, from one of the predefined gradients. Yeah, but that's the code just there. So we actually end up doing um, a truncation, then a lookup, then a compress. Yeah, and then we store as RGB pixels. So I also want to show the actual code to generating the fractals. So as I said before, this is actually the mul step. And what we're doing here is changing these steps to the complex multiplication to produce the uh, other interesting, uh, interesting patterns. So the first one just here is the normal Julius set. That's regular complex multiplication there. Um, the second one, skewed, uh, all I did was I removed that second part to the Julius set and I actually made an interesting skewed pattern. Yeah, so for the water fractal, I've just added a sine and a cos in there, or sine and cosine. Uh, the robots was interesting. For the robots fractal, I squared the imaginary parts of the um, complex results there. Uh, so kaleidoscope was um, a power function or a squared function and uh, a sine function. So a little bit of power and a little bit of uh, trigonometry. 
Uh, the vampire was computed with a, a power function or a square and then a sign and a bit of a power. Yeah, so if you do those uh, little lines of code there and you iterate out of the Julia set, you end up with a sweet little vampire bat. Uh, I don't know why, uh, but fun stuff, really. Fun stuff. Okay, so for the final example, what I wanted to show was um, an up-and-coming project that I'm hoping uh, is interesting for folks, and I'm hoping to develop further and uh, open up to the world as an open-source project on GitHub. Uh, okay, so RenderLab is a 64 bits per channel, non-destructive photo editing app. Uh, it runs at approximately 10 frames per second for a 6720 by 4480 pixel image. So that's a really, really large image. And I want to say that's not quite real time. So 10 frames a second is not quite real time. But processing an image of that size uh, at 10 frames a second on a little laptop, uh, it's really very, very promising. Okay, so the, the UI at the moment is, is very, you know, it's very, um, it's very awkward, but um, hopefully we, we can work on this. So it's just a little uh, hue, saturation and uh, value, hue, saturation and lightness, sorry. So as I grab this slider, what you'll see is the hue changing. Here we have the saturation changing. So we've a lot of saturation or kind of black and white. And finally, the lightness changing as well. Yeah, so what you'll see down the bottom here, it's taking about uh, 128 milliseconds for VCL to process this gigantic image at 64 bits per channel. Uh, so the uh, other thing that I'm using VCL for down the bottom here, I'm actually using it for the pack time. Yeah, so it's actually VCL that's packing this uh, 64 bits per channel down to uh, 8 bits using the dithering that we saw in the first example, uh, packing that down to 8 bits and uh, actually rendering it on the monitor. Uh, I think this shows fairly clearly that uh, 64 bits per channel image editing is, uh, is practical and possible right now with, uh, with today's hardware. And that is about all that I wanted to say. So thank you very much for watching. So I will leave a link down below for Agnifog's VCL. You can go over and have a bit of a look. It's completely free and open source. Uh, I will be putting up the source code for the first two demos. Uh, I'll be putting that up for the Patreons as early access. Uh, I will share that on a, a GitHub as open source in the coming weeks. And the other thing that I want to say is uh, just a big thank you to Mr. Fogg for his uh, amazing contributions to low-level programming. Yeah, and a big thank you for this excellent library, VCL. And uh, yeah, have a good day.